at this meeting. Well, a lot of new information came out. Let's go back to about two weeks ago when the university was toying with a tuition fee increase of 16.3%. That's now off the tables. Now, for Newfoundland students, the tuition fee freeze remains in effect. All other students will see their fees, tuition, stay at the same current rates until 2021. But there is one difference coming up, and that's for the non-Newfoundland students, the international students, students from other parts of Canada will see a different, will see increases come to them in about 18 months from now. Given that September is very close, we said it can't happen this September, it's got to happen next September to give students, uh, I guess, the, the opportunity to know and plan to be able to come here. Um, we will be increasing, uh, we are proposing to increase uh, today uh, uh, tuition for non-Newfoundland students, for Canadian students, uh, about uh, $400 a semester. Uh, and for international students, about $1,200 a semester. So that would get implemented for all new students who have never registered here before. The idea here, of course, is to uh, look after everybody who's enrolled at the university now, but things will change down the road. They're trying to uh, uh, not do any uh, harm uh, to international students who may have come here a couple of years ago. Uh, so they're going to delay any increases for them. Now, speaking of increases, it's still going to cost more if you'll be a student at Memorial University, regardless of where you're from, because they're coming up with a campus renewal fee. That means an extra $450 a year. Now, we were told as well that that money collected goes into a, spe a specific fund to keep the water and the rain out of the buildings and it will not go into general revenue. Also, there will be a new student services fee, about $50, I think, per course, no, per semester. And, of course, that new fee will apply to everybody. The university says in the next three years it plans to cut spending by about $13 million as well. That means there will be fewer faculty, fewer staff, and uh, Dr. Doreen Golfman says we will be shrinking. Uh, one more thing to point out, too. Uh, the, in their language is always reference to the non-Newfoundland and Labrador student. Well, what actually defines a Newfoundland and Labrador student has yet to be determined, and that will be worked on over the next 10 months. Debbie? Thanks very much. That's our Cease Hare reporting for us live this, e this evening. Well, there's movement afoot to increase the fight against opioid overdoses. A meeting was held at Confederation Building this afternoon to determine what to do next. It will look at making naloxone kits more accessible. Now, these volunteers spent the afternoon assembling antidote kits. Naloxone reverses the effects of an overdose and can save lives. They hope to finish 150 kits tonight. Of the 18 overdoses that have happened on the Northeast Avalon, three people were saved using one of SWAP's kits. But with growing demand, these volunteers are going to need help. We will be looking at procuring kits. Um, there's a number of pharmaceutical companies that produce these kits um, and they'll be procured through our health authorities um, and accessible to uh, the public and community-based organizations and other for-profit organizations who need access. There is now a human face to a tragic fentanyl overdose in St. John's. A mother of three is one of two people who took a fatal injection of drugs over the past several weeks. Her death serves as a stark reminder that the deadly painkiller is here and it is crushing families. Here now is Arianna Kellen spoke with the woman's father. This is Nikki Chapman, 39 years old, the mom of three boys under the age of 11. Until now, she was known as the second person to have died from a bad batch of heroin. Chapman was found unresponsive in a home on Empire Avenue in St. John's two weeks ago. My son had called me at 5 o'clock in the morning to inform me, and he was quite upset that my daughter had passed away from an overdose of heroin that was, uh, they figured was laced with uh, fentanyl. And uh, 
that crushed us. Chapman is one of 18 overdoses on the Northeast Avalon. She had overdosed the week before, but this time she wasn't as lucky. Her death came hours after public health officials warned of the deadly drug. I had a hint that she did have an addiction problem and drugs and pills and it started, you know, with painkillers and stuff and just got worse and worse. And plus her relationship was bad to begin with and she just didn't know how to deal with it. Her father is left grieving with little hope the fentanyl crisis will stop anytime soon. A lot of these people are sharing needles and passing it on. Hey, you go buy it. I'll share it with you. It's hard to track who's the person that's bringing it. Police know who's bringing it, but I don't think they have the resources or the help to, uh, to stop it. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. A woman in Central is urging others to be cautious when using sunscreen on their small children. Rebecca Cannon says she recently used spray sunscreen on her 14-month-old. This was the result the next day, second-degree burns on her face. Cannon says she then took the toddler to the doctor. He said the two different ways it could go here depending on how it looks now and how it heals up as to if it's a second degree chemical burn from the sunscreen or if it's such a severe allergic reaction to it that it caused a second degree burn. But um, as we were talking, he was saying that, you know, he sees this more than he'd really like to be from the sunscreen. Cannon says the product she used is meant for children, but not specifically babies. But it's the only product she had on hand that day, and she figured it was better to use what she had than nothing. Meanwhile, Banana Boat Sun Care Canada says it has asked Cannon to send the product so that it can be tested by its quality assurance team. The company says all of its products undergo rigorous testing uh, to make sure they meet Health Canada regulations. And coming up in about 25 minutes, I'll speak with dermatologist Ian Landells about some do's and don'ts when it comes to sun exposure and using sunscreens. Well, usually when the Premier takes questions, it's from journalists. But tonight, CBC is giving you the chance to ask a question of the Premier. Here now is Peter Cowan is live with the details. So, Peter, where are you? Well, Debbie, I'm in a place that normally I don't get to do live hits for here now. I'm actually in the Premier's office right now. We're just setting up and we're getting ready for tonight's Facebook Live. And uh, might as well show you around a little bit here and because uh, this is an opportunity to uh, see a little bit of where the Premier works. And the opportunity that you're going to have tonight is to be able to participate in the conversation that I'm going to have with the Premier on this couch. I've got the iPad here. I'm going to be looking at the questions as people send them in, and I'm going to be able to ask them live to him. The best way to participate is on Facebook. It will be starting at 7 o'clock uh, on the CBC Newfoundland and Labrador Facebook page. And we'll have about 45 minutes, so we'll get to as many questions as we can over the course of that time. And it's an opportunity for people who maybe have questions about the budget, things that weren't mentioned, or maybe some things that government has implemented that you may not be happy about, or maybe there's something that you just don't understand. It's an opportunity to come here with me into the Premier's office, ask him a question. Uh, so so we're just getting set up and uh, we'll be ready to go in just under an hour. Peter, and uh, we are going to check in with Peter once more before everything gets underway at 7 o'clock for the Premier's Q&A with you. And speaking of the Premier, Dwight Ball announced a Cabinet Committee on Jobs today. It'll be made up of seven Cabinet Ministers and the focus in the short term will be creating jobs in agriculture and aquaculture. There's no specific target in saying that, you know, there's going to be 10,000 jobs or 6,000 jobs. Ball says the committee will meet with industry leaders to come up with a plan to expand, but didn't have any concrete details today. That didn't sit well with the opposition. We heard nothing concrete this morning about what government is now going to do to to grow those industries. So yet again, we have a Premier who continues to make announcements about making plans to come up with plans. You didn't hear any specifics today other than that they're finally going to start saying, you know, I guess we, we got a jobs issue coming up. Premier said it, you know, should have been started five years ago. Uh, well, certainly should have been started 18 months ago in, in, in terms of their, the time they took, uh, took office. 
A government announcement this morning should lead to shorter wait times at the motor vehicle offices in Mount Pearl. Starting today, you can book an appointment online for services like registering a vehicle or getting a driver's license. And for anyone who shows up without an appointment, if there are more than 45 people in line, the office will send a text message to say when it's nearly your turn. We've chosen to offer these services here in Mount Pearl because this motor registration office is the busiest in the province. On average, more than 8,600 people come through these doors each month for in-person service. And you can imagine that during peak months, that number can be more than 10,000 people coming through these doors. And that usually means, as you can imagine, uh, some rather substantial uh, time waiting in line. Conception Bay South is trying to figure out why the number of people recycling is so low, even though there is a pickup service in place. Only 6% of items such as paper, plastics and cardboard are being recycled. The rest is going into the garbage. The town is now planning an advertising campaign to convince people that recycling not only protects the environment, but also saves the community money. The weight of cardboard is a good example. The town says it costs $67 a ton to dump it at the Robin Hood Bay landfill, but it only costs $20 a ton to recycle that material. CBS says that is a significant difference, meaning savings of more than $60,000 a year. Rogers TV has cut four positions from its stations in St. John's, Cornerbrook and Gander. That includes two full-time jobs and two part-time ones. The company didn't say what jobs were being cut, but says the changes will not affect its programming. Small towns in the province are being pushed into new water treatment regulations. They were announced in 2012 and some town managers are being told they could be punished if their town doesn't move fast enough. Here now as Chris Ensing explains. Beautiful Dover and its 662 residents is run by a town manager who says she's been threatened with possible jail time over wastewater treatment. My assistant said to me she thought that they were the FBI or something the way they came in. Dover is not meeting federal regulations for wastewater. In fact, municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador said only three communities in the province are after asking the federal government for an extension on their deadline. Yvonne Collins says Dover is working towards a solution but didn't realize she could personally be on the hook for the problem until federal environmental enforcement officers knocked on the door. They came in and they're asking us that it has to be done now. If it's not done, there will be a heavy, heavy fine and apparently I could go to jail. Well, why would I be going to jail when I can't do anything without council approval? Dover's mayor says his town wants to follow the guidelines. They just need the money and the information. Uh, the time frame, I think, is the one that, that we got to look at and make sure that this is done. We got no problem doing it. But, uh, Chris, when, when, when there's no money involved and, and, and the time frame, you know, you got to have it done today, is, uh, I think this is a big concern for us. Collins says she isn't the only one being threatened with fines or jail time. She says officers have also visited other communities in the area. They said they will be back, so I don't know if they're going to take me in cuffs or what, but they said they will be back. But we have all our documents and that what we've been doing. Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador say that's the best option going forward for communities to prove to federal authorities that they're trying to meet regulations to avoid potential punishment. Chris Hensing, CBC News, Dover. After the break, the story of a brazen jewelry robbery in St. John's that's putting a man behind bars.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Welcome back everyone and just you and me again, Ryan. Yes. <laughs> As we could see, Peter was uh, getting ready for his Facebook live uh, questions and answers with you and the premier that starts right after here and now and carolyn yeah we <laughs> got to give a shout out to carolyn uh, poor stokes he's feeling a bit rough uh, she has a, a terrible cold mm. she actually came in yesterday was going to give it a go and we basically all said go home <laughs> yeah. rest take care and uh, yeah so she might be back at the end of the week certainly by next monday yeah. so uh, take it easy. There. Yeah, definitely. Take it easy, uh, Carolyn. And uh, you know what? At least if you're inside and not feeling so great, uh, it's uh, the weather's not great. But it is uh, certainly one thing that has been positive about this weather is the icebergs have yeah. been in and around the coast and not just along the northeast coast. Yeah, there's something that we don't normally see on the west coast icebergs. And this one spotted near Grossmore National Park. Now, uh, this is uh, Forward Bennett with his granddaughter, and he's a lobster fisherman from St. Paul's. He says in his 55 years, he's never seen an iceberg in this part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. He says the area has been uh, busy with folks trying to get up close and personal to have a look, both locals and tourists. Wow, that is a dandy it too. Is. Beautiful. Um what would you call it? Striation? <laughs> yeah, very nice. It's, yeah, beautiful. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. And again, so one that's one positive, Debbie, of this northeast, relentless <laughs> northeast flow. Because obviously that berg has come in through the Strait of Belle Isle mm. and then made its way southward. And have a look at what those uh, northeast winds did today, temperature-wise. Four the high in St. John's, two in St. Anthony, three in Mary's Harbor, three in Nain. So basically... Everyone from St. John's to Nain in that same old northeast cold Atlantic flow. Temperatures warm as you work your way towards the inland areas and back towards the west coast of the island. Churchill Falls got to 11 today. Labrador City uh, hit 8 degrees for a high. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay in the 7 degree range with the wind coming up off uh, Lake Melville. And uh, as we take a look at current temperatures, still 15 in Stephenville. Beautiful evening on the port of port not so much in St. John's where the wind chill is zero thanks to that northerly and northeasterly flow and as I mentioned off the top of the show tomorrow is very much a rinse and repeat day uh, for the province where the northeast northerly flow not going anywhere the blocking high is parked and this next low which would normally be shooting into our neck of the woods from the south is not going to do so it's going to move to the north and west and move into the very soggy Maritimes uh, under another round of rain. The interesting part about this setup, Cape Breton will actually see upwards of 50 millimeters of rain over the next 24 hours or so. Yet just across the strait here in Port of Basque, the bit of drizzle, couple of drops, and that is the blocking high at its best here uh, or worst in terms of uh, just a very, very cut and dry uh, setups. And once again, for the West Coast tomorrow, we will be seeing some sunny breaks, a bit of drizzle along that Northeast Coast and not much of a break coming for Thursday either, but we are brightening up for Friday and into the weekend, uh, at least along the Atlantic coastline where we are going to be socked in again for the next couple of days. So we'll talk more about that coming up in your long range. There are your temperatures to start tomorrow. Again, chance of drizzle for pretty much everybody except for that West Coast. And I think the Buren will remain dry for tomorrow as well. Uh, for tomorrow morning, a chance of some patchy drizzle there. And as we take a look into Metro, Again, a very similar setup to what we had today. One on the plus side to start with some drizzle and fog. The fog will retreat closer to the coast into the afternoon. Four on the plus side should get anywhere from six to eight degrees for inland areas, much like we had today. We did see the Goulds popping up around seven or eight back towards the CBS area as well. That'll be the same setup for tomorrow with those north northeasterly winds. I think we're back to 12 degrees from St. Mary's Bay to Placentia Bay and back across to the Buren Peninsula. We're again a bit of a risk of some drizzle in the morning and then some sun breaks into the afternoon. I do think we'll see a bit of sun up towards the Harbor Breton region tomorrow, but the clouds dominate from Terranova through the Bay of Exploits. Chance of a sun break or two from uh, 
Grand Falls, Windsor to Badger to Buckins tomorrow. The Bayvert Peninsula remains very socked in. And note the bit of drizzle chance from Port of Bass to Burgio, but some sun breaks into the afternoon. Beautiful day once again. Stephenville, Cornerbrook up towards Gross Morn. Chance of some drizzle in the Humber Valley. There are those drizzle periods possible for the Northern Peninsula, Southeastern Labrador. Clouds dominate here with northeast winds. The coast of Labrador will be unsettled and clouds dominate here again for tomorrow. A little cloudier for Happy Valley Goose Bay and just 3 and 4 degrees in Lab West tomorrow. Long range details right through to the weekend, which again is a little bit brighter coming up. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, a brazen robbery at a St. John's jewelry store has led to a prison sentence for a local carpenter with a lengthy criminal record. Ronald Fitzgerald was given a 30 month sentence last time served. In March of last year, he ordered a staff at Devana's in the Avalon Mall to fill a backpack. Fitzgerald threatened staff and said he had a gun, although no one saw a weapon. He got away with stolen goods valued at more than $144,000. He was found a day later. The stolen jewelry was never recovered. A man with a history of violence is back in trouble with the law. Grant Tapper is again facing some serious charges. Here are now's Glenn Payot reports. Grant Tapper wasn't happy to see a CBC camera when he came into court today. Sir, is it possible to keep the camera down while this in process. Well, I gave you permission to do that. Okay, very good. Tapper is now accused of sexually assaulting a woman, hitting her with a hammer, forcibly confining her, choking or strangling her, and more. The offenses are alleged to have taken place in April and earlier this month in Torbay. More than a decade ago, he was convicted of aggravated assault. In 2009, a judge urged Tapper to take stock of his life. Tapper had been drinking when he slammed this blue car into this red car in Flat Rock. Tapper was sentenced to 23 months in prison for two counts of dangerous driving causing bodily harm. Then, in January of 2010, he was sentenced to 18 months for assaulting a fellow inmate at the penitentiary in St. John's. Coincidentally, the judge was Mark Pike, who was on the bench today. In February of 2010, Tapper was given a year in prison for having sex with this 13-year-old girl behind the price chopper in Tor Bay. The judge called Tapper a sexual opportunist who satisfied his sexual appetite with a child. Four months later, in June of 2010, Tapper was sentenced to nine months in prison for assaulting a prison guard at HMP. Since then, Tapper has had convictions for mischief, breaching probation, and in 2015, assault with a weapon. He was supposed to have a bail hearing today, but consented to remain in custody. Tapper is back in court next week. Glenn Pay at CBC News, St. John's. Sunscreen protects you from the sun's rays, but a mother in Botwood believes her baby's face was burned after she put sunscreen on her. Coming up, a dermatologist is weighing in on that possibility.
Welcome back, everyone, and let's get back to our top story. Munn's plan to deal with a budget crunch. Here now, CIS Hair is at Munn tonight, where the University Senate has met to talk about its finances and how to save money. CIS, what other details can you tell us about this meeting? Well, the big thing today is that there's a deferment or a delay of any tuition fee increases for Newfoundland Labrador students. Uh, the freeze for tuition stays in effect. It's the international students who will see a difference in about a year and a half from now. But the university today, Debbie, also spoke of how it plans to uh, cut spending. It wasn't an entire conversation about revenue generation. It was a, they also unveiled a $13 million plan, a $13 million reduction in spending over the next three years and MUN President Gary Kachanowski says that the, at some point in the future there will be fewer faculty and fewer staff at MUN. This will be uh, not easy and uh, if you're going to reduce expenditures for us that means also reducing people. Um, we've had planning going on already uh, over the last year, given that we were already scheduled to do three million in uh, uh, in salary attrition cuts just the year we finished, and another three million last year, we had planned for kind of worst case scenario and different scenarios uh, in uh, in different portfolio units. So planning has been on going underway of of where possible uh, reductions could occur. That would include both attrition uh, and even accelerated attrition if we can, or even than the need for uh, direct, uh, direct salary budget reduction. But And that meeting was held this afternoon in St. John's. The plan right now is to take this plan to the Board of Regents, and that meeting will happen on Thursday. It's the Board of Regents that signs off on the budget document. Now, I have with me an international student. Her name is Sophie Desacalzi. Kulzi, and she's from Ecuador. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, uh, and one quick question, what are your thoughts on the presentation today and how it'll affect you and other international students in the future? Yeah, uh, f uh, for start, I just want to point out that it's not only for international students, it's also for out-of-province students. And this uh, proposal is very problematic in three ways. First of all, it's just deferring uh, tuition fee hikes, uh, and those fee hikes are, are going to be uh, higher than the ones that were just proposed. We see a 30% increase. We see uh, higher ancillary fees. So uh, students are not going to... Um, get away with having a tuition freeze, there's still uh, a tuition increase, so we have to keep in mind that. Uh, the second problem is that uh, the, the senior administration has made no commitments to look into their own expenditures, like we've seen throughout the weeks and through request of information, lavish expenditures to resorts, uh, to dining and whining, uh, and, so, and so forth, and there were no comments to their own salaries and their own allowances. And the third uh, big problem is the direct attack on on our, st our regular staff and our faculty. Uh, the student movement is characterized for uh, I've been having a lot of solidarity among faculty and students and uh, regular staff, and we cannot take a blow on them or they cannot mm -hmm. take a blow on us. And there will be reduction. Sophie, thank you very much. No, thank you. Uh, Sophie is an international student at Memorial University, Grenfell campus from Ecuador, and uh, she also mentioned too these other fees. There will be, it will cost more to be a student at MUN in the future, uh, even if you're from this province. Outside of the tuition fee increases, we're looking at a new campus renewal fee and a new student services fee. Debbie? As we reported earlier, a little girl in Botwood suffered burns to her face after her mother applied a spray on sunscreen with her fingers. Rebecca Cannon says her daughter is being treated for second degree burns and will see a dermatologist later in the week. Now this story is sure generated lots of talk, so we've invited dermatologist Dr. Ian Landells to the studio. So Dr. Landells, first of all, I spoke with Rebecca Cannon just a short while ago and she said the only place that she put this sunscreen on was her daughter's face, which burned. The rest of the child was without burns. Is it possible that a sun block can actually cause a burn, a, maybe a chemical burn? It's very unlikely it'll cause a chemical burn. These products are tested to be applied directly to the skin. So there are a number of possibilities. One is it was outdated and didn't work and sunburn occurred. Another is that she may have been allergic to a component of that, which can happen. It's not common, but it can happen. Mm -hmm. And um, that, those would be the, the most likely possibilities. 
Let's talk about sunscreens. Spray on versus lotion. In this particular case, it was a spray on. Is there any difference? The only difference is the base that it's in and the, the way it's applied. And the sprays are developed for convenience. The biggest concern with sprays, the only concern really, really is that people tend to not apply enough or don't apply them properly. I've seen, I've been at Topsail Beach and get out of my car and I see people just doing this and spraying their arm and walking away. Yeah. You have to apply it the same way. You spray, you apply it to the whole area and then apply by rubbing it in so, so you guarantee that all areas are covered. We're so this is a, a spray on and I'm guilty of just going like that too, but you actually have to rub it off. Yes, in. if you just do that, it's only going to hit little spots. And I've seen people who've done that, you can actually see a band that isn't burned and the rest of the arm is burned because they just kind of went like that. What's the number one problem with how people use sunscreens? The, the number one problem is uh, most people don't use enough. They've actually done studies that show that people use about one quarter to one half of the amount of sunscreen you actually need to apply to obtain the SPF factor, the sun protection factor that's written on a sunscreen. Mm -hmm. So for example, for the face, we need half a teaspoon. For each arm, we need half a teaspoon. For each leg, we need a teaspoon. For the back, we need a teaspoon. For the front, we need a teaspoon. So we need to use about 30 milliliters or two tablespoons each time we apply sunscreen to you know, most of our body. It seems a lot. It, 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 it does seem a lot and, and people make fun of me because they say why are you putting on so much and I say that's because the amount you need. So to put that into perspective this bottle is about a quarter of a liter, 240 mils. This bottle should be empty after eight full applications. So if you have a family of four sharing this, this should, this should last two full applications. Oh my goodness, oh my. Okay, a lot to think about there. Are some brands of sunscreen better than others? Some do seem to be better than others, and there are ways that you can look to see if that is a good sunscreen or a bad sunscreen. The ones that you want to use should be a minimum of SPF 30. We never recommend less than 30, and higher is in fact better. You want to see one that blocks both UVA and UVB, broad spectrum. And uh, you also want to preferably see one that doesn't contain irritating ingredients. So one way to look for that is to look for the Canadian Dermatology Association logo on a product. And in the same way that toothpaste is endorsed, or, or not endorsed, but uh, recognized by the Canadian Dental Association, sunscreens are recognized by the Canadian Dermatology Association. So that logo tends to tell you it's a good sunscreen. You know, Rebecca's story about her daughter has prompted a, a whole lot of chatter online and uh, in the airwaves, <laughs> on the yeah. airwaves. Um, and some people have commented, well, I don't use sunscreen because I don't like putting all those chemicals all over me. I mean, is that a genuine concern? Not really. Uh, it, that's basically fear-mongering. There are people out there who make these allegations about sunscreens without really any evidence or, or any knowledge. Uh, they, it's just kind of more fear. And these products are tested exhaustively. They're approved by Health Canada. All of the ingredients are tested by Health Canada and approved for application to the skin. Having said that, it, where it's just on the skin, it doesn't really get absorbed into the body to any extent. And so even if the ingredients did cause problems, if you ingested them internally, that doesn't happen. We do, however, know that ultraviolet radiation causes cancer. And we do, however, know that sunscreen prevents skin cancer. And a lot of uh, research you've told me about prior to the interview from Australia, it really has lessened the incidence of skin cancer. It, ha it has. And One of the things, uh, just in uh, conclusion, Dr. Landells, uh, we're all hoping for the summer yeah. <laughs> to uh, be here eventually, but you don't necessarily need bright sunshine at all to put on the sunscreen. Well, that's the most important point you could make. Most people think it has to be warm and sunny to wear sunscreen. And I've been seeing my patients in the last two or three weeks saying, have you been wearing your sunscreen? They said, well, not yet. Clearly, it's been an awful spring. Well, it has been an awful spring. However, if you look at the UV index every day, which health, uh, with Environment Canada, which uh, publishes every day, the UV index has been five, six, seven, and even eight in the last two or three weeks, almost every single day, including the foggy days, all the cold days, you need sunscreen if it's three or above. So you would burn very quickly in the, in the last few, the last two to three weeks. And last weekend in particular, uh, the UV index was six or seven 
and, and you would burn quickly. Dr. Ian Landells, thank you very much. Thank you. Live from the Premier's office where we're getting ready to do a chat with him. What sort of questions could he be facing? Well, I'll give you an idea coming up. In less than half an hour, Premier Dwight Ball is going to be sitting down with our Peter Cowan. He's taking your questions over social media, and it's happening live tonight on our CBCNL Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. So, uh, Peter, who's getting set up in the Premier's office right now? Peter, what sort of questions are you expecting? Well, this is kind of the interesting thing about this, Debbie, is normally when I'd go into an interview with the Premier, I'd know exactly what I was going to ask. I'd have some rebuttals ready and, you know, sort of know the rules of the game. The interesting thing about this is I don't even know what the questions are going to be that people are going to write in. I have already, you know, there have been people who've reached out to me to already send a few in that I'm sort of primed with, and I don't want to give away all the details in case the Premier's watching in the next room to uh, get a few hints. But, you know, the issues around things that were in the budget, um, for example, the protests around last year's budget, I, I know those are definitely going to come up. We're in the middle of contract negotiations, so, you know, that may be an issue that comes up tonight as well. And uh, I just want to ask you, how unusual is it for premiers to put themselves out there like this? Yeah, this is a little bit different. Certainly technology has made this easier for us to be able to do something like this, because traditionally with TV, you know, you watch at home, we do our job here and there isn't much interaction. This gives us the opportunity to interact with the audience a whole lot more and take these questions on the fly. In many ways, though, this is almost going back to the way things were back the very first Premier, Joey Smallwood, when you could sort of walk into Confederation Building, walk into the Premier's office and have a chat with him. A lot has changed since then. Security is a whole lot tighter. Uh, but this is sort of the virtual reality equivalent of this, that people will be able to join us here in the Premier's office to ask the questions. And hopefully my job tonight will be to try and see that they get some answers out of it. Well, it sounds great. I know uh, you're looking forward to it. I hope we uh, hear from a lot of participants and uh, we'll be listening. And that all gets underway at 7, correct? Yep, 7 o'clock on our Facebook page uh, is the best way to do it. It's not going to be on television. It's going to be on Facebook. But we'll play some of the best questions and answers tomorrow night on Here and Now as well. Okay, thanks very much, Peter.
The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Okay, it's May 9th. Yep. Um, we're going to talk about snow that's still on the ground and out in Central, where I spend a lot of time out in the Terranova area. Six feet, at Still. least, in the woods. <laughs> yeah, and in the woods makes a big difference. I know Gander is, and I'll show some of the numbers from the official uh, weather stations, but I know Gander is actually officially down to less than 10 centimeters, but there's mountains in other areas. In the bush and in the woods, it's going to be a little bit higher. But an interesting tidbit here, uh, snowpack across the northern hemisphere is higher than average right now. And when you look at the map, and I will zoom this in, but a significant portion of, and again, the colored areas in the green, then blue, then purple, those are the areas that have, have higher than normal snowpack for this time of year. This is a snow depth departures map, and a significant portion of the higher than normal snowfall for the northern hemisphere is right here at home in Labrador and across to northern parts of Newfoundland. Siberia also making, an, uh, 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 also helping to those uh, totals. But here at home, it is indeed Labrador and up across Baffin Island, where northeastern Canada is uh, one of the spots where we are seeing that higher than normal snowpack contributing to that higher than normal snowpack across the northern hemisphere. In terms of the snow on the ground at the official Environment Canada weather stations, Cartwright still reporting 57 centimeters as of yesterday. Uh, Nain sh just shy of that and Blanc Sabon 27 and there is Happy Valley Goose Bay and Gander again just less than 10 centimeters, but I'm sure some of you in your backyard would say, well, I've got more than or less than that. Well, again, variable snowfall, obviously, and especially in terms of melting where the spots are, are getting a little bit more melt than others. Highs today, well, certainly a bit of snow melt again across the province a little bit, and we're slowly making progress here, but this area of high pressure isn't helping things in terms of the blocking high keeping that cool flow in place and keeping any rainfall that would uh, help to wash away some of that snow over to the south. As I mentioned earlier, 50 millimeters on the way over the next 24 to 36 hours for Cape Breton, yet just a few drops. And in terms of drops, it's drizzle. Just that possibility for Burgio and Port Bass just across the strait. That blocking high keeping that system off to our south. Tomorrow highs range from 4 to 3 in the northeast to 14, 13, even 15 in the south and west. And there are those cool temps along the coast of Labrador as well. Uh, we will get just to three or four degrees in Lab West for tomorrow. And as we roll forward into your Thursday time period, that blocking high staying to the north and it's the same uh, kind of flow where we've got those periods of drizzle possibilities, that north northeast flow on the go for Thursday. And that will keep temperatures along the coast in that four to six, seven, eight degree range. Even a little bit cooler, I think, with the clouds a little more dominant for Thursday. Uh, West Coast temperatures, I think, will be limited to that 12 to 13 degree range. Starting to brighten up in Labrador as that area of high pressure will be sinking a little bit further southward in the coming days. And note for Friday, getting into a bit more in the way of some sunshine, especially into the Friday afternoon time period. Perhaps areas just along the coast will stay a little bit more in the way of a dominant clouds and some patchy drizzle, but there are your temperatures five, uh, six, seven, eight, nine degrees. And again, back towards the 12 degree range for you folks in Labrador. So as we move forward, you will certainly see a little bit more in the way of bright skies for the weekend into Monday, Tuesday, as an area of high pressure sinks in from the north and that blocking high will no longer be to the north, but it will actually be moving right overhead. And that's why we're talking about temperatures even into the teens by Monday for parts of the island. And there's the setup in Labrador also brightening and warming. Sounds great. And something else that's great. Our young athlete of the day today is a swimmer from the CBS area. Ava Sears is 10 years old and is a member of the CBS Blue Fins Swim Club. Ava is proud to continue to participate with the pre-competitive Blue Fins team three times a week. She has lots of fun working with the coaches and swimming with all of her Blue Fin teammates. Congrats on being chosen as today's Young Athlete of the Day, Ava. A somber anniversary in Nova Scotia today, 25 years ago. A deadly explosion in the West Ray Mine. That story after the break.
Nova Scotia is marking a somber anniversary. It was 25 years ago today that a deadly combination of methane gas and coal dust exploded in the West Ray Mine. 26 people were killed. Uh, the mayor, or Premier Cuiar, is um, talking about 2,700 homes in the province who face yeah, I'm sorry, and uh, my apologies to the audience. We uh, have definitely uh, got the wrong script with that particular story. So, okay, sorry for that. Uh, we will change gears just a little bit. Uh, this is a Canadian first. A Toronto area man has had his beloved dog cloned. Matthew Johnson started the whole process last summer. Now, nine months later, the cloning is complete. He now has genetic twins of his best friend, Woofy. CBC's Ali Chasson caught up with Johnson and his two new pups. Like when we were first introduced to them, this one like jumped up, barked at me and like looked me like dead in the eyes. I'm like, yeah, that's Woofy. Woofy Jr. and her twin Blondie have been home for just two days. Doctors at the cloning lab told Matt Johnson the pups will be more like Woofy twins at best, but one of them just has Woofy's way. And I put Woofy's toys out, I saved them all. That one was like, uh, whatever. She went for like the exact ball that was like Woofy's baby toy. Oh and it's like, and guarding it too. We met the original Woofy in August. At 20 years old, she didn't have much time left and passed away shortly after we met her. At the time, she and Johnson made headlines for the wacky idea of cloning his dying dog. But this is not a man who throws down almost 90 grand just for the experiment. It's about having a dog that was in tune with me that actually was in unison with how I am, if I'm sick, if I'm happy, if I'm sad, if, it, if I needed the dog to help me walk with my past illness and stuff. Um, it was more about companionship. Clone Woofy sleeps by Johnson's chest the way original Woofy did when he was in his hospital bed fighting for his life from a meningitis infection, not to mention the uncanny looks. It's crazy, like every marking is the exact same. It's just like like little junior Woofy. She has that same slinky walk from her dingo ancestors, and now that man's got his best friend back, Good girl. Johnson feels whole again. Get your toy. So there could be a number of reasons why cloning your dog might not be for you. Besides that $90,000 price tag, Matt Johnson tells us when the story originally aired, he got a lot of flack from people who argued that there are plenty of dogs in shelters who need homes too. Johnson says he respects that opinion, but he didn't want a regular dog. He wanted a woofy. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. And now back to our story out of Nova Scotia, where they're marking a somber anniversary. It was 25 years ago today that a deadly combination of methane gas and coal dust exploded in the West Ray Mine. 26 people were killed. This morning, there was a march to remember the victims. It was also an opportunity to reinforce a message about mining safety. The tragic event created new laws that aim to better protect miners. Today, Canada has some of the strongest health and safety legislation in the world for miners and the highest fines for companies that violate those laws. Damaged part of a tunnel where untreated nuclear waste is stored in tanks triggered an emergency alert in southwest Washington state this morning. It happened at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. That's about 275 kilometers southeast of Seattle. There were no workers in the tunnel and there have been no reports of injuries. The facility has been undergoing a cleanup for nearly 30 years.
Welcome back. Well, there's nothing like a family road trip, is there? Uh-huh. Get a load of this family. Geese caused a bit of a slowdown in Edmonton yesterday huh. morning. It seems the goslings couldn't get up the curb, so mom and dad took them for a walk across a bridge. Some friendly, friendly Edmontonians gave them an escort. Oh my, managing to keep the birds confined to one lane. Now after about 90 minutes, they finally reached the end, uh, trading the road for some brush. Aw, they're cute. Apparently they need a little help here getting up. Oh, there's one. Uh, and they... Uh... <laughs> Just needed a little helping hand. There we go, <laughs> nice. Good stuff there. Why don't we jump right to your viewer picture of the day. Good to see uh, inland uh, lakes becoming ice free in uh, Newfoundland. This was Red Indian Lake, okay. uh, courtesy of uh, Dave Wilcox, a frequent contributor for our photos. And a beautiful sunset shot there. Yeah, that's easy for you to say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good night, everybody.